Hello and welcome to China Dispatches, a European Chamber podcast that shares underground insights from European business leaders and experts on doing business in China. I'm your host Ray. With China's economy gradually getting back on track, global economic growth expected to slow, ongoing geopolitical tensions, and the transition to long-term management of the COVID-19 pandemic, as advised by the World Health Organization in May. What impact will these developments have on the talent market in China? And in response to those challenges, how are HR professionals' strategies on workforce management evolving? In today's episode of China Dispatches, HR heads will give their responses to these questions and more. I'd like to welcome our guest speakers, Sun Ning Sun and Wang Shu Hong, Chair and Vice Chair of European Chamber's Human Resources Forum in Beijing. And Ning Fei, Head of HR and Workplace, Airbus in China. Thank you very much for joining. Let's start by looking at the big picture. With the outlook for China's economy recovery unsure and a slowing global economy, what will be the impact on HR strategies in China? I think one of the big trends during the COVID is. The employees are searching for purpose in their life, and they also like to work for a job that is meaningful. And also, they like to work for a company that provide an open environment and take care of employees' well-being. So this also affect our HR strategy. And in our company, what we are more focused on now today is one thing: to develop、uh, leaders to be able to empower the colleagues. And、uh, to be able to delegate and developing people, and also we are very focused on developing、uh, organization that provide、uh, engaging working environment. We t- we care about employees' well-being, mental and physical health, and we have this、uh, Nova Health program that covers six parts of the employees' well-being, like physical health, gym, health check, quit smoking assistance, and the healthy food and weight management, etc. And all these promotions of the programs will help employee to understand that the company really take care of their well-being while working here. And we also encourage、uh, managers to develop people to promote internal job rotations. And we provide a lot of trainings and just to help people develop within the company and with together the company. And、uh, I think these are the big things that we are looking for. The employee and the company growing together and the mutual benefit、uh, each other. In terms of、uh, strategy, I would say Airbus we are in a long lead kind of、uh, industry. Therefore, we have always been focused on the long term strategy. We are not、uh, adapting our strategy year by year. We have always been focused on three main pillars: first, the individual development, and then the leadership reinforcement,、uh, like、uh, Shu Hong was mentioned. And thirdly, how to continue to providing an engaging, inspiring environment to attract and retain top talents in the industry. So this、uh, will remain. However, at the operational level, indeed, as Shu Ho mentioned, there will be a lot of more means focus on the current challenges. So just give me one concrete example. During the COVID time, we have merged the HR and the facility management and the security、uh, safety. Department. So the purpose is、uh, try to say, no matter from a soft or a hardware side, we should、uh, provide a consistent approach to enable、uh, inspiring, safe, and healthy working condition for our employee. So this has、uh, seen a huge success because、uh, through the merge of the different、uh, functions, we could see we can provide a canteen service. Uh, even the meeting room optimization with all this hardware, how to continue to boost our employee experience, and and on top all the well-being programs. Because I'm a Malay from a、uh, middle-sized company, so、uh, what we are doing is、uh, much more、uh, that the HR work、uh, related with the business.、Uh, after COVID, the Chinese market is recovering. So、uh, we will、uh, relocate our recruitment work firstly according to our business. Right now we are opening several、uh, sales 
positions according to different kind of application of the potential market. That is part, and that is the front part. And for the factory part, we also try to find the good people to enhance our efficiency. So right now, in order to enhance the efficiency, we are still keeping on the efforts on the digitalization. So uh, we also have the budget of people of ERP system. So uh, this is more related to with uh, the efficiency part. On the other hand, uh, we also take care about the uh, long run development or career plan of people. And uh, for the high management level, uh, as uh, Shu Hong and uh, Fei uh, mentioned that, we also pay attention to the leadership. And you see that actually in the middle sized company, the leadership uh, of the managers are more important. And uh, sometimes for the managers, they sometimes also combine with some HR functions. They also should have the HR talent. They must be multi skillful to deal with the different kind of uh, personnel related uh, things. So we, we really want to support upgrade of the leadership of the middle management. And uh, then for the employees, we uh, like to support them to have more uh, expertise to let them to get their uh, certificate and uh, or in their position to get more training to improve their expertise. So this is in general our plan this year. No matter in what kind of economic situation, develop people is still the key for every company. Mm. As a result of the multiple lockdowns that were imposed throughout China to control the COVID pandemic, resilience has become a recurring buzzword among business leaders with most companies adopting flexible work models in order to maintain operations at the greatest extent possible. In terms of coping with crisis, how do you think European companies in China performed? Working in the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical company, our industry is less impacted by COVID. On the contrary, the patients need treatment and we have uh, been performed well in terms of uh, serving the patients and uh, provide the product access. And a lot of effort has been uh, made. I would say as a company who has a very clear purpose, helps a lot because I see a lot of uh, colleagues taking initi initiatives in coping with uh, patients who lack of uh, you know, uh, product access and they help them to find uh, our product in the drugstore. And, uh, and that has been really very positive when we have uh, you know, developed a very strong company culture and people have a very clear sense of purpose. We know we develop a business uh, around the patients to be patient-centric and uh, that result in a good business performance for us. As a European company in the aviation industry, I would like to say I'm super proud of how Airbus has weathered through the storm giving some concrete examples uh, in business-wide and also the HR world. In business-wide, one thing I want to highlight is uh, our industry is a highly impactful industry. So we are impacted by COVID. We are also impacted by geopolitical tension. However, our CEO, global CEO, has made one sentence really impressed me. He said, during the crisis time, people tend to avoid do big decisions because it's crisis time, people tend to be very conservative. But uh, we are very resilient and we are very proud to be bold to make some big decisions during the crisis time. We announced uh, the second final assembly mine in China. We are setting up R&D center in Suzhou. We are setting up also aircraft recycle business. All these are very visible and uh, very impactful business uh, investment from Europe to China. So from business side, I can say I'm super proud. Then from the HR side, during the crisis, even we cannot meet up uh, in a physical sense, but uh, headquarters has always paid a lot of attention and care to employees in China. During the crisis time, even we have to manage the very difficult retrenchment like uh, many companies, but we could uh, do it in a very socially compliant and people-focused way. After that, uh, we are also put a lot of effort on well-being programs. So headquarter was uh, asking us, do you need more financial support? Do you need uh, any kind of technical support? So we could manage this with a full empowerment and a support and care from the headquarter. 
So this is something I have to say, we are proud how we're coping with the crisis. For business part, we taste the sweet and the bitter part. <laughs> For the sweet part, I think the others, we have enough orders. We call that uh, in, internally a uh, backlog is okay. But uh, the painful part is supplying. Supplying why? There are too many reasons. One is uh, about traffic. We formerly used uh, the train, but uh, during the COVID and the war reason, the train between Europe and Asia stopped. So that, that increased our shipping cost. Another reason is the increase of our raw materials, such as the chips. The chips uh, around two years and one year ago, uh, the price increased a lot. That really uh, influenced us about our product cost control. That influenced us deeply. We cannot transfer all the increase of cost to the customer. We should decide to buy ourselves. So we feel suffer about that. Sometimes people say that the three year COVID period, just like examination for companies. So always we can find the solutions to work together. So I think uh, although it, it was a tough time and it is really a great opportunity for the, the team uh, integration or uh, team leadership, uh, uh, I think a training opportunity. So far the result is very good. And uh, for HR part, I think um, uh, we also did a very good job uh, because in Bernard Control, the EHS part, that uh, position uh, is part of HR in, in our company. And uh, this team uh, kept a close communication with the local government with that kind of very supportive uh, action. So during the last three years for our Beijing factory, there is no lockdown in, in Beijing. So that is a really, really very good result to ensure the production globally for, for the whole group that make the company really competitive, especially during the last uh, three years. Can you share some good examples of the different kinds of flexible work models that European companies have adopted over the last three years? We have adopted a flexible work arrangement during the COVID, but not, not only for the COVID, because I, I see some extreme examples. People have been working away from the office, for example, in, in US for two years. And we have practiced over the COVID. What we found is as long as people have very clear task, and uh, if you have a, have a good people, no matter where they work, they will deliver the result. So that really gives the company confidence to apply flexible work working model. What we are having today is we have um, flexible working hours in the day, that and also one day uh, working from home during the week. And this is set policy, and it's applied everywhere in China. And somewhere else in the world, they have applied the two days working from home and three days working in the office. And it worked well. And we don't see any kind of uh, decline on performance and et cetera. And we still keep a very high engagement level. And uh, from the recent employee engagement survey, what we found is we our engagement kept really high and uh, our company performance uh, really well and the flexible working model seems really serve the company very well and also benefit the employee, give people more flexibility and also give them the opportunity to spend less time on commute from home to office. And it's also in a way helped environmental uh, protection. As a, a company that preach for uh, sustainable development, and this is also a very good way to support the social and environmental responsibility. Uh, we, we also tried the, the flexible working time and the uh, online way for communication. But the, the topic for us is, uh, is a little bit different. Is uh, uh, Bernard Control is a production company, manufacturer company. So we cannot complete everything <laughs> from home. So we really need, for, especially for the uh, factory part, we really need our employees to go to factory to assemble to uh, assemble the product so we cannot complete everything at home. So why I say balance, because sometimes you see that, we, you, you know, we have a sales team, we have R&D and also, also office people and also the workers. Sometimes the workers cannot understand, okay, they can work from home. Why not? We cannot uh, work from home. So uh, sometimes they think that not uncomfortable. They think the work from home is a kind of thing of rest 
because uh, they think that, oh, that, that is so very, you can not only take care about uh, the work and also take care of a family, they also want to try that kind of way. So uh, what we can do is, uh, especially for HR, to let workers to understand, that, oh, you, we have different kind of position, different kind of function. And also, on the other hand, we should provide more comfortable uh, working area and uh, to uh, give special care for the workers to can uh, accept this kind of situation. So how to balance the, the attitude, uh, mindset of people is a key part for us during this period. When we decided to do the hybrid model, we tried to uh, explain the concept. It's not a top-down. So this has to make sense for the individuals, for the company, and for the team. So we have been uh, laying out a global policy to say up between zero to 40 percentage of your working time, you can decide where to work alternatively. However, this has to be a group decision. It deserves a proper discussion at the team level, organization level. So it's not uh, simply this manager say, mm, yes, uh, you can up to 40. The other manager say, no, sorry, you do zero. So we have uh, requested the uh, managers at each level, did this a proper discussion, become a team decision, then documented and validated by management. So that makes our hybrid working, I think is more sustainable today. Because today I also read and hear worldwide, they are especially like in Silicon Valley, people start to uh, challenge, ask, uh, does it make sense? Probably they have gone too far. Uh, with the way how we manage it, I think uh, we are rather in the safe side. I think it's a sustainable approach. Are you seeing any changes in the way that companies are changing their requirements regarding the skills they are looking for in the future candidates? The candidates or the talents who are looking for for the future are certainly those who can embrace the digital world digitalization. That is about improved efficiency. It's about the modern way of work. Because what happens with the digital world is the knowledge information will be available. You, you will spend less time on processing the information. But well, on the other side, people need to be really generate, uh, need to be creative, and to be work on the things that cannot be replaced by the AI, or by the digital uh, solutions. So I would say the ability to work with digitalization, with the digital solutions, the future demand for the candidates. In that sense, people who have open mind, curiosity, and uh, who are able to learn, to have that learning agility is very much needed for the future candidates. Uh, thank you, Shu Hong. Actually, if I was asked first, I were going to mention some of the, definitely the key words you have been using, like uh, mm -hmm. analytic, uh, curiosity, and uh, lifelong learning. I think this is, uh, also has been highly promoted during the 2023, the Future Employment Report of the World Economic Forum. So these are the common trends, I think, for the future talent. I will focus on one point, uh, probably out of this, is uh, this open-minded. With the current crisis uh, worldwide, no matter it's uh, the health crisis or the war and the energy, I think uh, being open-minded is getting even more important. Uh, we need to have this openness to try to understand the work, try to bridge work, then we can all have a sustainable business to do together. So this is uh, clearly something we are going to focus on more on, on the soft skill side. The hard skill side is, I think, uh, following the industrial revolution, uh, we are also looking at uh, people in the field of AI, in the field of cybersecurity. So these are the, some critical and emerging competences we are focusing on. Yes, for me, I think I fully agree with uh, Fei and Shu Hong. The mindset of people are so uh, important. And uh, we also uh, pay more attention to the soft skills, especially the skills to work under stress. I think the stress always will be there no matter during the COVID period or afterwards. So that is really important. And uh, following this kind of situation in our company, we also right now is leading a project called that Think Big. I mean, sometimes when you are in uh, trouble or facing a challenge, how to solve this problem? Sometimes if you can put this topic in a bigger background, 
to think afterwards and beforewards and also more openly and uh, bigger background, you, you will feel there will be a way out and you will feel much more comfortable. Great advices from all of you. Staff retention has always been very challenging and was even so during the pandemic, particularly among foreign nationals. What are some of the main challenges European companies have faced in retaining staff in recent years? I can say from the pharma industry, in the past few years, we have a lot of uh, newly startup companies uh, in pharmaceutical company, and they are looking for experienced people. So talents with good experience are very, very attractive for those companies. And uh, in the past few years, we do in face, uh, facing challenges. Uh, with this high demand. But um, I would say what we can do for a company to retain good people is to fit what the talents needs. You know, the, the talents need a challenging job, always, you know, challenging their uh, intelligence. Then they need to grow and they need to get, a, you know, always looking for challenge, expand their, their scope. And they're looking for development. They are looking for a company that serves good purpose. So these are the things uh, we are working on and to spot the talents and move them and give them challenging jobs and de- keep them developed. And these are the things we can do to retain those talents. But uh, on the other side, I don't see many, uh, especially the foreign colleagues leaving the company. Mm-hmm. They are basically on the expatriate assignment. We see a good retention of uh, foreigners working in China. I think uh, worldwide and uh, for HR, this retention has been an issue which is reinforced, uh, I think, during and even post-COVID. Uh, we hear about the great resignation in the U.S. and even in Europe, maybe not as uh, straightforward or so visible in China. But I think this is an issue we are all facing. If we will talk about uh, down to industry level, uh, for our industry, uh, I have to say, fortunately, our product has always been quite visible and uh, also due to the specific uh, technology, we always attract people who are passionate for this type of product industry. So our uh, attrition has not been really high over the years, even though there's some turbulence during the COVID time, but very short time. However, we do see a trend of challenges to continue to attract uh, foreign profiles to come into China, new expatriates to come into China. I think it's partially also due to the last three years, China kind of closed the doors. So this is the area we are putting a focus, try to reinforce, try to recover the confidence. And at the same time, we also try to improve some of the local hide foreign condition so we can tap into the local uh, foreign market and the third is uh, we also open some of the previous uh, condition for expatriates only to also international profiles, uh, those like uh, students and uh, Chinese working abroad, uh, living abroad many years. So this is uh, for us the current challenge and uh, the focus we have. Because we are from a very niche industry. So not so many people know about our product and know our technology. So the training of new people is very important. So right now, just after the COVID, we start to have a new e-learning platform and to train our new people. When a newcomer comes to our company, we have a set of training to know our product or market and those kind of things. And for the port people, uh, I think right now it's suggested by Chu Hong and they said that how to uh, support them to have uh, the continuous uh, career plan in uh, burnout control is uh, key important. That basically I think is to let them their personal target or personal plan to align with company strategy. That is very important. They can develop together with the company. So this is what's our focus right In our previous discussion, we've touched a little bit already on employee development. Could you share some new ideas of concepts that are currently out there in terms of employee development? We have this 70-20-10 rule in the personal development, and I think that is still valid. I mean, 70% of the personal development 
come from experience, come from you know extended responsibility and by the challenges in the work. And the 20% come from you know coaching, mentoring from peers, from the other people. And 10% come from the programs. I think that is uh, still valid. What I see a big, I would say, trend is we not only develop people's competence and make people a, a better person, uh, a more, you know, on the soft skill side, for example, what you mentioned earlier, resilience, how you make people be more resilient. That is not only about their hard skills, what they learn, the things they need in their work, but also, you know, to have this kind of uh, mindset and soft skills in terms of a resilience, in terms of having a growth mindset, in terms of, uh, you know, how they be themselves. And I would say this is probably even more important for people to have a sustainable growth to fit the future job requirement. Actually, uh, employee development is a big topic. I hear about some uh, practical uh, experience in our company. Uh, right now we are uh, using for the middle management so every company they, they will have our standard kpi system but uh, in our company in order to integrate uh, uh, especially for the middle management team to have uh, good performance we, we will have a separate small projects for example right now we have uh, for the manufacturer part or for the factory part we have uh, the inventory project that we will lead to the r d uh, supply chain and the production people to work together. And uh, also uh, for the sales team, sales team sometimes so we are leading the international project. Uh, for example, right now we are uh, have a very big project in Singapore. So right now actually I lead that by myself. I also the MD of China. So I lead that and uh, coordinate that between our project team and OEM team and back office to that the, all the team to work together to especially just measure that, to have the chance to improve the soft skills across the teams. So we, we normally to use the, the concrete project to uh, integrate team, to develop uh, our management. I would agree really with you both. Uh, at the end, I think employee development has always been a crucial uh, measure for any company uh, for the global uh, skill set as an organization. At the same, same time, it's also an important measure to retain talents. From Abbott's side, we have been trying to focus on, it's not really something new, but let's say two structures. First is a, we call the modular approach. Similar as Shu Hong said in 70, 2010, uh, the concept is to say each individual you are different and uh, you might learn differently, also at the different uh, phases of your life. So we try to promote uh, at a modular approach. You can learn it by doing, you can also learning by contributing or learning by giving something to the community or to the colleagues around. And they are also learning by expedition, like going out to, to do some, go to schools or go to some forums. And the second point is uh, we also try to couple this uh, employee development uh, linked with uh, their employment cycle with the where they stay at the age of the phases of their career life. Either you are a newcomer or you new manager or your experienced manager. So the whole thing is to try to make it more personal so they can benefit from a more focused learning. The European Chamber released a Women in Business report in December 2022 that shows the progress some of the largest European companies operating in China have made in promoting gender diversity in leadership skills, as well as in their general workforce. So the last question is, what advice would you give to a female employee who would like to climb the career ladder? You see, I'm uh, not only the HRD uh, in Bernard Control uh, Asia, and also the MD of uh, Bernard Control China. So I think uh, uh, this might be a good example for the ladies uh, to see that uh, we, we women or we ladies also can be in the good position, not only for HR and also uh, for the business as well, and also for the company high management. And uh, uh, in this position, I can, I can feel that women also have special talents for some area, for example, for communication and also for leadership. 
we are born as leader because we are mom. <laughs> uh, so I think there is no problem for that. And also we can be uh, very innovative. For me, I not only take care about the HR and also business and marketing. Just mentioned there are manufacturing company, there are uh, traditional company. But in my company, uh, we also design some uh, cartoon image for mm -hmm. our products, just like uh, Jingjing for Aoyun, Aoyun Hui. Uh, so we also have that kind of innovation actions as well. So women, I think, we are quite competitive. I think we are also outstanding in the professional career opportunities. And it is absolutely we can be successful. If there's a piece of advice, first, I fully agree with uh, Sandia, and uh, I think uh, you invite as many uh, of us, you can see our passions for this topic. So I agree with what uh, Sandy said, female, uh, we definitely have a clear role to play in a leadership role. So if there's only a piece of advice I want to give for our uh, lady colleagues, I would simply say dare, to dare more. I think this is often something has been really pushing us back. And I personally also experienced that uh, myself and uh, but, uh, thank all the mentors I have, all the support I got. So I think uh, that way will be the first step. Uh, you need to dare to think big and dare to dream big. Yes. And uh, then try to find also on the way the support you can have. So here I would like to also pay a special attribute of thanks to the European Chamber for the, the mentorship program we launched uh, for mm -hmm. women leaders uh, in the industry. And I know my colleagues benefit from it. I also have colleagues that contributed to it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with these two uh, colleagues, Sunny and Faye. Both of them are very good examples of uh, strong you know, female leaders who have navigating both the business leader and also the uh, uh, human resource uh, leaders in their own company. I love this topic very, very much. I have been actually personally done quite a lot of research in this area. I would say there is certainly one thing and it's a starting point. The other thing is to find a mentor or sponsors along the way. And uh, because one thing for women very often uh, lack of uh, attention, lack of uh, exposure in the world that's full of uh, male colleagues, full of uh, male leaders, I think to make yourself exposure and to make it clear, transparent about your personal ambition it's also very important to get a support from the organization. I think these are the things I would say there and find a mentor, be clear about your ambition and make it transparent and looking for support. Thank you. Great advices from all of you. That's all for today. Thank you to our guest speakers, Sunny, Shu Hong and Fei. If you like our podcast, Please subscribe to China Dispatches, recommend to your colleagues and friends, and share on social media. We would also love to hear your feedback. You can find contact details in the show notes. This is Ray from China Dispatches. Thanks for listening.